How did the days of the week get their names? In the English language, some of the days of the week take their names from the celestial bodies that according to ancient beliefs, ruled that day. So the day ruled by the sun became Sunday, the day ruled by the moon became Monday. And the day ruled by the planet Saturn became Saturday. The remaining days of the week take their names from figures in Anglo-Saxon or Norse mythology. Tuesday is named for the Anglo-Saxon god of war, Tiu, which is Mars in Roman mythology. Wednesday is named for Woden, the Anglo-Saxon name for the chief Norse god Odin. Thursday gets its name from Thor, the god of thunder in Norse mythology. Friday is named either after Freya, the Norse goddess of love and fertility. Or Frigg, the wife of Odin and the representative of beauty and love. What is literacy? Literacy is the skill of being able to read and write fairly well. Unlike speech, reading and writing do not come naturally, they have to be learned. Most people who live in industrialized or developed countries can read and write because everyday activities there depend on it. Developing countries in places like Asia and Africa with very different ways of life from the industrialized nations have low literacy rates because most people there can get along without the skill. Some tribal languages don't even have a written form. Almost 30% of adults in the world, people 15 years or older, cannot read and write, or are illiterate. Even in such wealthy, highly developed nations as the United States, many people don't know how to read and write. Why do we use money? We use money as payment for goods or services. Today people use coins, bank notes, bills, checks, credit cards, and debit cards. The cards used at automatic teller machines, or ATMs, to pay for things. Before money was invented, you could only get something from another person by bartering or trading something else for it. It was hard to make even trades and the deal had to be made on the spot. The introduction of money offered people greater flexibility when trying to get goods or services. It made it possible to put standard values on things, and money could be saved and used for future purchases. A great variety of objects have served as money for different people around the world. Anything considered valuable by a group and important to its way of life can be used as money. Shells and feathers, furs and cloth, salt and cattle have all been used at one time or another as money. Setting the standard by which the value of all other things were measured. From earliest times, precious metals like gold and silver were used as money because they were durable. Materials that could be easily handled and divided, and they were considered valuable by many groups of people. 
carefully weighed amounts of these metals were used as money. A practice that led to the invention of coins in the 7th century BC in the kingdom of Lydia what is now Turkey. Early metal coins were stamped with designs that showed their weight and value. Similar to the coins we use today. Money bills or banknotes came into use around the 10th century in China. Because Chinese coins were so heavy, people started to leave them with merchants. Who gave them written receipts that were sometimes used to buy things. The Chinese government soon took over the job of printing receipts that people could use as money. While they are just pieces of paper and not valuable themselves. Banknotes became money because they represented valuable things like gold and silver kept in other places. Coins, too, eventually became symbols of value rather than actually being worth something the coins that were once made of silver and other precious metals are now made of combinations of inexpensive metals. The bills, checks, and credit cards that we use today are likewise representative money used because of their convenience. How do plants grow? Special cells in plants produce hormones. Chemical messengers that tell different plant cells to perform certain activities. Plant hormones are responsible for things like fruit development. The death of flower petals and leaves, and, most importantly, for growth. Cells in stem tips, new leaves, and buds, for instance, produce various growth hormones that tell plant cells to multiply by division or to become larger. The pattern of growth in plants offers an important example of how they differ from animals. While animals eventually become fully grown, and live for a long time after that point. Plants never stop growing throughout their life cycles. In other words, there is no such thing as an adult plant that no longer grows but continues to live. How hot is the sun? The temperature of the sun's surface is thought to be about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 5,500 degrees Celsius. That's more than 50 times the temperature required to boil water. The center of the sun is much hotter. Scientists have estimated that the center of the sun is 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. 15 million degrees Celsius. What is a sonic boom? As long as an aircraft is moving at a rate slower than the speed of sound, about 1,120 feet. Or 340 meters per second, which is known as Mach 1, the air that it disturbs is evenly distributed around it. But as an aircraft approaches Mach 1, the air molecules in front of it become crowded together. The impact made when an aircraft flies through them called breaking the sound. 
Barrier causes shock waves that reach our ears as a thunderous sonic boom. The aircraft leaves the waves behind as it enters supersonic flight. A supersonic airplane is shaped quite differently than a regular, subsonic plane. It is usually shaped like a dart. With a long pointed nose and wings that swing back and hug the plane body. This slim shape causes less friction as it races through the air. The close set wings also stay within the shock waves the plane creates. Which is necessary to maintain control of the aircraft. While the special wings of supersonic planes don't provide as much lift as those of regular planes. The aircraft get the lift they need for takeoffs and landings by traveling at very high speeds. Why are pigs so dirty? Because pigs will eat almost anything, they have traditionally been fed with farm leftovers and waste. This unappealing diet commonly known as slop may contain food waste from a farm household or the unusable. Byproducts of the manufacturing processes for things like butter and cheese and even beer brewing. Pigs are natural foragers. Frequently using their snouts to dig up roots or grubs for food when they are in the wild. On farms they are fed from low troughs. But their big snouts and foraging habits still make them very messy eaters. Adding to the dirty reputation of pigs is the fact that they have usually been kept in pens. Or styes close to farm buildings to make their feeding quick and easy. They and their messes have been confined to small spaces. Unlike cows and sheep, which are free to roam pasture land. Because pigs are raised mainly for their meat and fat. They are given a lot of food and spend most of their time eating. Piglets that weigh only a few pounds at birth can reach more than 200 pounds. 90 kilograms, in less than half a year. Why do I shiver when I'm cold? When your brain receives the signal that you are cold, it sets off a series of reactions. One of these reactions causes your muscles to repeatedly and quickly contract, or tighten, and relax. Muscle movement uses energy and produces heat, that is why people become warm when they exercise. In other words, when you feel cold. Your body starts working on its own to make some extra heat to warm you up. Why are barns usually painted red? Paint coats wood protecting it from sunlight and rain damage and making it last longer. When early farmers had enough money to paint their barns, they usually used inexpensive paint because the structures were so large. Ferrous oxide, a chemical powder that gives paint its red color, was readily available and cost little. Thrifty farmers in New England, New York, and the Upper Midwest region painted their barns red. 
In those places, red barns remain a tradition. But there are plenty of barns in other parts of the country that are not red. Early farmers that were poor especially in regions like Appalachia and the South left their barns unpainted because they did not have the money to do the job. Unpainted wood usually weathers to a soft gray color. And in places like Pennsylvania, Maryland, and some southern Midwestern states. The most frequently seen barn color is white. Some people think that white barns grew popular when dairy farming became more important after the Civil War. White suggests cleanliness and purity, desirable qualities to be associated with milk production. Special farms where fancy horses or prize livestock were raised. Sometimes had barns painted unusual colors, like yellow, green, or black. What kind of government does the United States have? While many people describe the form of government in the United States as a democracy, it is technically defined as a federal republic. Federal means that the individual States have some power but that a central national government has authority over them. Republics and democracies are, in fact, very similar, and in some cases, interchangeable. In a republic, the people have the power to elect leaders who govern according to a set of laws. In the United States the Constitution and the Bill of Rights lay the groundwork for all laws that follow. That definition is very close to that of a kind of government called constitutional democracy. In that type of government, people exercise political power by electing leaders. These leaders, and the citizens of the country, are bound by a set of laws that guarantee certain freedoms. Like the right to speak freely or practice any religion. While the US government may be defined as a republic. Many of its governmental processes are democratic in spirit. Why does a compass needle always point north? A magnet made of iron or other special metals that are electrically charged has two poles or ends, where its magnetic strength is greatest. Each end has an opposite electrical charge. When two magnets are held near each other, the poles that have the same charges repel each other. While the ends with opposite charges attract. The needle of a compass is a magnet and, believe it or not, so is Earth. Earth's greatest magnetic strength is concentrated at the magnetic north and south poles which are different from the geographical north and south poles. So a compass needle is attracted to the opposite electrical charges of Earth's poles. With the tip of its needle always pointing north and the bottom of its needle always pointing south. How can scientists tell the age of fossils? Scientists can learn many things about the conditions on the planet and ancient animal behavior from fossils. 
they can learn whether an area was once covered by lush forests. For example, or they can determine that some dinosaurs traveled in herds. They can also tell, in many cases, how long ago the fossilized plant or animal lived. One way to narrow down a fossil's age is by seeing what layer, or strata, of rock it appears in the deepest layers contain the oldest fossils, while the top layers contain the most recent fossils. If they know the history of other fossils found nearby, specifically when these other animals lived, then they can determine the approximate age of newly found fossils. In some cases, scientists can pinpoint the age of a fossil by measuring something called a radioactive isotope. An isotope can be thought of as a version of a chemical element, like hydrogen or carbon, that has a slightly different atomic makeup than other versions of that element. For example, one isotope of hydrogen has one particle, a proton, in the nucleus. Another isotope has two particles, a proton, and a neutron. Both are hydrogen, but they are different types of hydrogen. A radioactive isotope is one that is unstable and gives off some radiation. Over time, radioactive isotopes decay, forming a different chemical element altogether. For example, uranium eventually changes into lead. Scientists know how long it takes for various radioactive isotopes to decay. They discuss this time in terms of the isotope's half-life. Or the amount of time it takes for half of the isotope to decay. If a radioactive isotope has a 1,000-year half-life, then half of it will have decayed in 1,000 years and all of it will have decayed, or turned into another element, in 2,000 years. So let's say a scientist measures the amount of a radioactive isotope in a chunk of rock. Knowing that this element will have completely transformed into another element after 2,000 years. If the scientist finds very little of the isotope and a great deal of the element it turns into, then he or she knows that the rock and the fossil found in it is almost 2,000 years old. Do groups of stars form pictures in the sky? Since ancient times, people have noticed certain bright stars in the sky that are arranged in recognizable groupings. Often a grouping reminded these ancient people of the shape of an animal or an object. Or the stars' shapes reminded them of one of their gods. Ancient Greek astronomers gave these groupings called constellations many of the names that we still use today. Some examples are Leo the Lion, Corona the Crown, and Orion, a character from Greek mythology. Altogether, scientists have identified 88 constellations in the sky. Though their visibility varies with the time of the year and the location on Earth of the observer. What did dinosaurs eat? Dinosaurs came in many different shapes and sizes and they also had a variety of diets. Most dinosaurs ate plants, 
with the very large dinosaurs eating leaves from the tops of trees and smaller ones eating plants and bushes growing close to the ground. Some dinosaurs were meat eaters, with most hunting other animals for food. And some being scavengers who ate the flesh of dead animals they encountered. The hunters preyed on plant eating dinosaurs and even on each other. Smaller meat eating dinosaurs fed on other animals, like insects, lizards, and mammals. Evidence suggests that some dinosaurs hunted in packs, while others lived solitary lives. How many muscles do I have? Scientists can't agree about how many muscles the human body has. Depending on whether certain muscles are counted separately or considered part of a larger muscle. The numbers range from 656 to 850. Muscles make up almost half of a person's body weight. Every movement your body makes depends on muscles. Voluntary muscles, which you control with conscious thought. Move the skeletal muscles on the outside of your body. When you raise your hand or chew your food, for example, you are using skeletal muscles. Involuntary muscles, on the other hand, move things inside your body. Usually without you thinking about them at all. Your heart pumps blood and your stomach and intestines move food through your digestive system. For instance, without your conscious thought. How are books made? Once a book has been written and edited, it must be typeset, printed, and bound and today those tasks are performed mostly by machines. The typesetter follows the instructions of the book designer, taking a regular looking electronic document. Like something you might create on a home computer for a school report. And formatting it so it looks like a book page with type in all different sizes and styles. After the book has been proofread checked for mistakes the typesetter either. Prints out the pages onto a special kind of paper that can be photographed or. Creates a special computer file containing the whole book, including pictures. The second method, called electronic prepress. Eliminates several steps for the printer and has become far more common in recent years. Regardless of the method used for delivering the book to the printer. Whether on camera ready paper or a computer disc, the printer must create several large negatives. Like the ones you get back with your pictures when you've had film developed at the drugstore. Each negative contains several pages of the book. These negative sheets, called flats, are placed over a thin metal plate that is sensitive to light. Like the paper that photographs are printed on. When exposed to light, the images from the negatives the words and pictures of the book appear on the metal plate. Which is now ready to accept ink and print the pages of the book. The metal plate is loaded onto large cylinders, tubes, and covered with ink. 
which only sticks to the parts of the plates that have the letters and images. Then large sheets of paper are rolled through the cylinders, which press the ink onto the paper. Once the ink has dried, machines fold the sheets of paper many times over. Pinching, pulling, and creasing them. Each large sheet, once it's been folded up by the machine, forms a section of the book. Called a signature, and all the sections of the book are then put together and readied for binding. The final step of making a book involves either gluing or sewing all the signatures together. Attaching the cover, and trimming the pages so all the book's edges are perfectly even. The book is now ready to be shipped to a bookstore or library where it can be read and enjoyed. What do the stars and stripes on the United States flag mean? When the first United States flag was adopted in 1777, it had 13 alternating red and white stripes. 7 red, 6 white, and, in the upper left portion, 13 white stars on a blue background. The number 13 was chosen because that was the number of original states that formed the United States. For several years after that design was adopted, a new stripe and a new star were added each time a new state joined the Union. But in 1818 Congress decided to keep the number of stripes at 13 and simply add a new star for each new state. The US flag has several nicknames. The Stars and Stripes, the Star Spangled Banner, and Old Glory. At the time the US flag was designed. The stars and stripes, and the colors of each, were given no specific meaning. The ideas for the design most likely were based on other countries' flags. In 1782, when the national seal was designed and the flag was incorporated into it, national leaders decided that each color and symbol should have a meaning. As reported in the book Our Flag, published by the U.S. House of Representatives in 1989, it was decided that red symbolized hardiness, strength and valor bravery. White symbolized purity and innocence, and blue represented vigilance, perseverance and justice. It has also been said that the stars are symbols of the heavens. And the stripes represent rays of light coming from the sun. Why are some kids better students than others? Some children do better in school than others for many reasons. All kids have different talents and abilities, and some of these just show up better in school. Some children may be naturally better at reading and writing and working with numbers. And at storing and using information. Most schoolwork requires these skills. So kids who are strong in these areas are likely to be better students. Other children, whose special talents may lie in music or art or sports, may not do quite as well. Still, most kids have enough ability to learn the basic skills taught in schools. Things that they will need to know to get along well in the world once they graduate. 
but remember that schoolwork does take effort you can't learn if you don't work at it. A student can almost always become better by caring more and trying harder. Even if it requires asking for special help. Good students usually come from families that consider education important. And they put a lot of time and effort into their studies. Why are the oceans salty? Oceans are salty because the water that fills them contains dissolved salt. Just like the kind we use on our food. The amount of salt in ocean water varies from place to place depending on the different sources of water nearby but averages about 3.5%. Over the course of millions of years, rivers flowing over salt-containing rocks have emptied into the oceans, bringing along dissolved salt particles. In addition, salt has leaked from solid salt-containing rocks directly into the seas. Salt can also enter the oceans from volcanic activity on the seafloor. What are the greenhouse effect and global warming? A greenhouse is a glass structure built for plants. The glass walls and ceiling allow the light from the sun to enter but prevent the sun's heat from leaving. Providing the kind of warm climate greenhouse plants need. Certain gases in the atmosphere act in much the same way as the glass panels of the greenhouse. Letting sunlight shine through to the ground and trapping the heat produced by that light. The greenhouse effect happens naturally, without human interference. But by introducing large amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, human beings have turned a natural occurrence into a potential problem. With the industrialization of the 1800s and 1900s, the amount of greenhouse gases increased tremendously. Some greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide, are produced by burning such fuels as coal, natural gas, and oil. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased by about 25% in the last 200 years. Plants absorb some carbon dioxide, but much of it rises to the atmosphere contributing to the greenhouse effect. Other gases that contribute to the greenhouse effect are ozone and methane. If too much heat is trapped in the atmosphere, it may eventually make Earth's climate warmer. This effect, known as global warming, may seem harmless enough. And if you live in a place with harsh winters, it might even seem like a good thing. But the delicate balance of life on Earth can be severely disrupted by a change in the planet's climate. If the temperature of Earth's surface increased enough, it could melt the polar ice caps. The massive, thick ice formations at the North and South Poles raising the level of the oceans and possibly flooding coastal areas. Climate changes can also affect weather patterns changing rainfall and snowfall. Amounts and making storms more severe and the lives of plants and animals.
What is wind chill? Wind chill describes the chilling effect that moving air or wind has on the way we feel different temperatures and on the way our bodies react to them. Two days with the same outdoor temperature will seem quite different if one is very windy and one is not. Because the wind carries heat away from the surface of our bodies, making us feel colder. This effect is called the wind chill factor. A wind chill index or chart has been developed that shows how certain wind speeds or velocities make different temperatures feel. In very cold climates it is important to know the wind chill, it tells people who live there how to dress to protect their skin from frostbite, a freezing of the skin that can cause permanent damage. Why do we hear ocean sounds when we hold shells up to our ears? Many of us have held a large shell, usually a conch, pronounced conch, up to our ears and heard what sounds like waves crashing against the shore. The magical part is that you can be miles from the ocean and still hear that sound. How do snakes move without legs? Snakes have no arms or legs yet they can move fairly swiftly through grass, sand, and, in some cases, water, and they can easily climb trees. Snakes can achieve such amazing mobility thanks to well-developed muscles and a row of scales. Called ventral scales, on the undersides of their bodies. They usually rely on the ground's rough surface to provide resistance. Something for them to push against that isn't slippery. Most snakes move by coiling their bodies into a series of S-shaped loops. With each loop pushing against the ground. Some large snakes, like boas, move in a way similar to a caterpillar, inching along the ground. Snakes that live in the desert have a harder time getting the traction necessary for movement. These snakes, called sidewinders, move in a sideways motion that allows them to slither along on the ever-shifting sandy surface. While the absence of limbs might seem like a handicap, Snakes have certain advantages thanks to their unique bodies. Not only can they move quickly and easily over and through a variety of landscapes, they can also move in near silence, making it easy for them to sneak up on their prey. And their narrow, flexible bodies allow them to fit into small crevices and holes where they can wait for unsuspecting animals to come along, or where they can hide from predators. How many kinds of fish are there? There are around 25,000 different species of fish, with hundreds of new species being discovered every year. Of all the vertebrate groups including fish, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and birds fish are the most diverse. 
Most fish have scales, but some do not. Some are brilliantly colored, others blend in with the muddy sea bottom or the plants they live amongst. And certain fish can even change their colors to match their changing environment. There are even fish that can glow, a function called bioluminescence. In the pitch black world of the deep sea. Some fish have sleek, torpedo shaped bodies with fins, some have spiny or puffed up bodies. Others are flat and still others have long, snake-like bodies. The largest class of fish by far are the bony fish, or osteichthyes. This class includes most of the fish that people catch for fun and for food. Like salmon, trout, tuna, sole, and perch. All bony fish have a skeleton that is at least partly made up of bone. And most have plate-like scales, a cover over their gills, and a swim bladder. Which is a sac filled with gas that the fish can empty or release to control how closely they swim to the surface. The bony fish range in size from the goby which is one of the world's smallest vertebrates at about one half inch, one centimeter, in length. To the enormous whale sharks, which can get as long as 50 feet, 15 meters. Among the most fascinating classes of fish are the cartilaginous fish. Or chondrichthyes, including sharks and rays. Chondrichthyes have skeletons made of cartilage instead of bone. Cartilage is an elastic tissue that is more flexible than bone but can still provide support. Pinch the tip of your nose, and you'll see what cartilage feels like. Sharks have scales, but not like the ones found on bony fish. Shark scales feel rough like sandpaper, and they are made of a material similar to teeth. In fact, the teeth of sharks are actually modified scales. Sharks usually have powerful tails, a blunt snout, and powerful jaws with multiple rows of teeth. If a shark loses teeth while feeding or fighting, new teeth from the back rows will move to the front. Many people think of sharks as savage and dangerous. But in fact only a small number pose a threat to people. While some sharks can get extremely large, most species are smaller than 3 feet, 1 meter, in length. With the smallest shark, the dwarf dogfish, measuring only about 8 inches, 20 centimeters, long. Another type of chondrichthyes, the rays, have wide flat bodies with the eyes on top and the mouth and gills underneath. They live at the bottom of the ocean, moving slowly through the water by gracefully flapping their wing-like fins. While many rays are harmless to humans, some such as stingrays, have narrow tails with sharp, poisonous spines. If the stingray feels threatened, it can whip its spiny tail at its enemies, causing extremely painful and sometimes severe wounds. Rays range in size from a few inches to more than 20 feet, 6 meters, in width. Another class of fish, known as the jawless fish, or agnatha, includes lamprey eels and hagfish. Many of these primitive species are parasites, meaning they live off other organisms. 
lampreys in particular have caused major problems for commercial fisheries. Destroying large numbers of trout and other fish in the Great Lakes and other regions of the United States. They have long, eel-like bodies and round, jawless mouths. They attach onto their prey by suction, biting into a fish's flesh with their small, sharp teeth. Their skeletal structure consists only of a cord made of cartilage. Called a notochord, running the length of their bodies. Why do some people have to wear eyeglasses? Some people have to wear eyeglasses because their eyeballs are shaped a little differently than normal. Either their eyeballs are a little too long from front to back or a little too short. When light rays enter the dark center of the eye, called the pupil. A lens focuses them onto the back of the eyeball the retina. Their special nerve cells send signals through the optic nerve to the brain. Where these signals combine to make a visual picture. In an eyeball that is too long, images of distant objects are focused in front of the retina. Instead of on the retina, and are blurred. People who have this condition are said to be nearsighted, or myopic. Which means they can clearly see things that are nearby, but far away things are fuzzy. About 20% of the population has to wear eyeglasses for this condition, which seems to be inherited. In an eyeball that is too short. Images of objects are focused behind the retina, blurring things that are close by. A person who has this condition is said to be farsighted. In both cases, eyeglasses are used to correct the problem. The extra lenses of eyeglasses correct what a person's own eyeball lenses can't do. Which is to focus light rays directly on the retina, where they belong. Different shaped lenses are used to correct nearsightedness and farsightedness. As people get older beginning in their 40s they often find that they need to wear eyeglasses to see close objects well even if they've never had a problem seeing before. Eyeglasses to correct this condition are frequently referred to as reading. Glasses because a close activity like reading often becomes impossible without them. The lens of the eyeball can be thickened or narrowed to some degree by eye muscles. Though not enough to correct nearer farsightedness, to help it focus on objects. But with age, the lens of the eye hardens and its ability to change shape to focus on close objects is reduced. How large was the biggest earthquake ever recorded? Throughout recorded history, Numerous giant earthquakes have occurred, each resulting in human losses numbering in the thousands, sometimes several hundred thousand. The most deadly earthquake may have occurred in the summer of 1201 in a region covering part of Egypt and Syria. Historical records show that this quake killed more than one million people there. An earthquake in China on July 27, 1976, 
is estimated to have killed more than 600,000 people. A giant earthquake occurred in Chile on May 22, 1960. Its shock waves measured 9.6 on the Richter scale. Thousands of people were killed in Chile, and the tsunami, or giant ocean wave, that it produced killed many more people on the islands of Hawaii, Japan, and the Philippines. It is not always the earthquakes with the biggest shock waves that cause the greatest damage. A large quake that occurs far out in the open ocean, for instance, may cause few problems. Earthquakes that hit cities where a lot of people live, on the other hand, cause the most harm to property and humans. How do submarines sink and rise? The body of a submarine is uniquely constructed. Under its strong outer hull are huge ballast tanks that surround its working core. The tanks can be filled with and emptied of seawater and air. Which allows the submarine to sink or rise in the water. When a submarine travels on the surface, its ballast tanks are filled with air which makes it less dense than the seawater it displaces, and it floats. But when a submarine needs to submerge or dive below the surface, its ballast tanks are flooded with seawater. This action makes the submarine sink. Now equal in density to the water that surrounds it, it can move about below the surface. Motor-driven propellers are used to move the vessel along, its streamlined shape creating as little water resistance as possible. And swiveling fins located on its sides, called hydroplanes, direct it up and down. When a submarine needs to return to the surface, compressed air stored in tanks is blown into the ballast tanks. This air forces out the seawater, and the vessel begins to rise, aided by the hydroplanes. Once again lighter than the seawater it displaces, the submarine is able to float on the surface. If Earth is moving all the time, why don't we feel it? Even though Earth rotates at a startling speed, 1,036 miles 1,668 kilometers per hour at the equator, and orbits the Sun even faster, at 67,000 miles 107,000 kilometers per hour. We don't feel it because the rate of motion is a constant one, never slowing down or speeding up. We can only really feel motion when the speed changes. If you were in a moving car and couldn't see the scenery passing by, couldn't hear the wind blowing, and couldn't feel the car vibrating, you wouldn't be able to tell how fast you were going, or even if you were moving at all. Objects don't fly all over the place when Earth moves because gravity keeps everything firmly in place as the planet orbits and turns. What is a comet?
while asteroids are made mostly of rock and minerals. Comets consist of ice, particles of dirt and dust, and gases. They have been compared to gigantic dirty snowballs that orbit the sun. As these icy bodies get closer to the sun, the sun's intense heat turns some of the ice in the comet's nucleus, or center, into gases. These gases, and the dust particles that used to be frozen inside them, fly off the nucleus into space. Forming a gaseous outer covering of the comet, called the coma, and a long, glowing tail. While the nucleus of a comet is only a few miles across, the coma can be as big as 1 million miles. 1.6 million kilometers, in diameter, and the tail can extend for millions of miles. Usually comets can only be seen from Earth with a telescope, but sometimes. When they pass close to the sun and are at their brightest, Comets can be seen just by observing the night sky. The enormous comet Hale-Bopp passed within 122 million miles, 197 million kilometers of Earth in 1997 and could be seen without a telescope. The famous Halley's Comet, pronounced Halley, also called Comet Halley, orbits the Sun once every 76 years. Give or take a couple years, becoming visible when it gets close to the Sun. Last seen in 1986, Halley's Comet isn't due back until 2061 or 2062. English astronomer Edmund Halley gave the comet its name. He was the first to suggest that comets traveled in regular orbits. An interesting story about Halley's Comet involves the great American author Mark Twain, whose real name was Samuel Clemens. Born in 1835, Twain came into the world in a year when Halley's Comet, then a great mystery to scientists, was visible in the sky. Fascinated by the comet's orbit, Twain later predicted that he would die in the year when the comet made its return. This prediction came true Twain died in 1910. A year when Halley's Comet was once again visible in the night sky. When he made the prediction, Twain imagined God saying. Now here are these two unaccountable freaks, they came in together, they must go out together. What does adopted mean? Sometimes children cannot be raised by the women and men. Responsible for their births their natural, or birth, parents. This situation arises for many reasons, the parents may be too ill or may have died. Or they may feel that they are too young or too poor to raise children properly. Happily, many couples, or single women and men, want to raise the children of such parents as their own. When a child is legally adopted, the law recognizes that the new parent or parents and the child are connected in the same ways that natural children are connected with their parents. Sharing the same rights and duties. Once a child is adopted, his or her birth parents lose all legal control over that child. What the law doesn't state but what every adopted child knows is that the love shared with an adoptive parent is the same too.
who wouldn't want such a feeling? But not everyone can be the best on a particular day or even at a particular game or sport. Every person is unique and has his or her own strengths and talents. Just because you are not the best at some activity doesn't mean that you can't participate in it and even have fun. And as you continue to play that sport or game, your skills will probably improve. If you can see the game as a way to improve your own skills and to have fun, you may even be able to admire and learn from the talent of the person who beats you and congratulate him or her. After all, it's only a game. So remember that when you play a game, the object is to participate well. Play fairly, with respect for your teammates and opponents, and with your best effort. It is also important to show good behavior following the game, whether you win or lose. If you can do that, then you are demonstrating good sportsmanship. Being a good sport is actually much more important than being a winner. What is hell? In many Christian religions, hell is the place of punishment where people go after death if they have not lived good lives and followed the rules of thought and behavior set forth by God in scriptures. Sacred writings, like the Bible, and in the teachings of churches and religious leaders. Hell is believed to be a horrible place because it is the opposite of heaven. Hell is a place where a person's spirit will forever be deprived of the presence of God. To never know the joy of God's presence, believers feel is so painful that it is compared to burning in earthly fire forever, one of the most awful things that can be imagined. Just like with heaven, people have tried over the centuries through paintings and writings, to create images of hell, a place of enormous suffering. And as heaven is thought to be located above, hell was given an opposite location down below. Satan, or Lucifer who, according to the Bible, was a favorite angel of God's until he disobeyed him as the ruler of hell. In many Christian religions, Satan and his wicked angel followers, devils, are thought to be the cause of evil in the world, always tempting people to be bad. Many non-Christian religions also teach of a place like hell, where people who have led bad lives on earth must go after they die. Even the ancient Greeks and Romans, who lived before the development of Christianity. Believed in an underworld, a place where people traveled to after death. Good and bad people lived in different places in this ancient underworld. What is lightning? In a large rain cloud, as water droplets bump into each other and increase in size, they become electrically charged. This activity causes electric charges on the ground, too. Sometimes the charges increase until they become so strong, 
up to 200 million volts. That electricity runs through the air between the cloud and the ground in the form of a giant spark or lightning bolt. Sometimes, instead of reaching from clouds to the ground, lightning strikes between two electrically charged clouds, or within a single cloud. This lightning looks like a sudden glow of light in the sky. Quite different from the jagged streak of light we think of as forked, or bolt, lightning. How is medicine made from plants? Beginning in ancient times, people discovered through trial and error that certain plants could treat diseases, heal wounds, or stop pain. This valuable information was passed down from generation to generation. Today companies that make drugs either raise these special plants and extract their healing substances to put into medicines or study the plants and make chemical substitutes in laboratories. Currently, at least 25% of all the drugs that doctors prescribe still use extracts that come directly from plants. A substance called digitalin that is found in the leaves of the flowering foxglove plant. For instance, continues to help people with heart problems and the dried sap of the seed pot of the opium poppy plant is still used as a powerful painkiller. New plants with healing properties continue to be discovered in unexplored places like the rainforests. But sadly large portions of these habitats have been and continue to be destroyed. How are seeds made? Conifers plants that bear cones and flowering plants all make seeds. Plants that produce flowers, called angiosperms, cover 90% of Earth's land surface. Most of the plants we know, like broadleaf trees, vines, grass, and more, are flowering plants. Although sometimes their flowers are so small and colorless that we barely notice them. While flowering plants now dominate the world, that was not always the case. They are relatively new to Earth, appearing just 135 million years ago. In ages before then, simpler plants dominated. The Great Age of Conifers, which bear seeds in cones, began 300 million years ago. Coniferous trees, which are part of the plant group gymnosperms. Like pines, spruces, firs, and cypresses, bear male and female cones. Male cones contain sacs that release millions of tiny grains of pollen male reproductive cells into the air. They are carried by the wind to female cones that have reproductive cells located in ovules, which are sticky and attract pollen grains. When male and female cells meet, fertilization occurs and seeds form in the scales of a female cone, which increases in size as the seeds grow. Once the seeds are mature, which takes a couple of years, the cone opens to release them. Equipped with a wing to help it to travel in the wind. 
Each seed has a tough outer coating and some food inside to use if it finds a good spot to start growing. Seed making in flowering plants is a little more complicated. Most flowers contain both male and female sex cells. The typical flower has four main parts, an outer cup of leaf-like sepals. A ring of petals within the sepals, and inside, male reproductive organs surrounding female parts. Male cells develop in structures called stamens and travel enclosed in the hard shell of pollen grains. Female cells, or ovules, develop deep in a flower's ovary, enclosed in a structure called a pistil. The top of the pistil known as the stigma is long and sticky and a good target for pollen. After it reaches the stigma, a small tube grows out of the pollen grain. The male cells travel down the pollen tube, eventually reaching female ovules. Then fertilization occurs and seeds start to grow. Since flowers possess both male and female parts, some flowers can fertilize themselves. Or fertilize another flower on the same plant, which is called self-pollination. Or the ovules of one flower may be fertilized by the pollen of a different. Flowering plant of the same species, a method called cross-pollination. The wind, water, insects, and other animals help to carry pollen from one flower to another. Cross-pollination usually produces a better plant. The offspring of cross-pollination possesses the genetic traits of two parents. Which may give it new characteristics that will help it survive in an always changing environment. Cross-pollination is so desirable, in fact. That many flowering plants have developed different ways to keep self-pollination from happening. In the flowers of a spiderwort plant, for example. The stamens are ready to release pollen grains before the pistils are ready to accept them. So the pollen has to travel to other spiderwort plants in search of a ripe pistil. What is sap? Sap is a term used to describe all the fluids that travel through complex types of plants. Fluids that move through transportation systems made of special xylem and phloem cells. Sap is water with substances like minerals or sugar dissolved in it. Some plants, like maple trees and sugar cane, have so much sugar in their saps that they are raised commercially to make syrup and sugar. Other plants have specialized saps that are hard or sticky, like latex, which is used to make rubber. The sticky gums and resins produced by many trees are thought to protect them from damaging insects and to seal any holes or tears that might occur in their barks. What does the brain look like? The pinkish-gray spongy tissue that makes up most of the brain's outer covering is folded over many times onto itself, forming numerous ridges. These folds allow the brain to have a larger surface area and more room for lots of nerve cells than it would have if it were smooth. 
the brain is one of the largest organs in the human body. From about age 6 onward, the brain weighs about 3 pounds, 1.4 kilograms. While wow, that's only about 2% of an average person's body weight. The brain uses about 20% of the body's oxygen. And if it's deprived of that oxygen for longer than a few minutes, it can become seriously damaged. How does a vulture find its food? Most vultures dine on such appealing items as garbage and carrion, or the flesh of dead animals. They soar high above the ground on their large, wide wings for hours at a time, searching for a food source. Scientists aren't sure how they know where the carrion is. But they suspect it may be a combination of sight and smell. Turkey vultures, common in North America, have a well-developed sense of smell. Though scientists aren't sure how they could smell their food from such lofty heights. It's more likely that they rely on their vision to spot animal carcasses. Or to find other scavengers that have already located a feeding site. While the idea of an animal eating garbage and carrion may be disgusting. It is actually a very beneficial practice. Vultures and other scavengers perform a valuable service. Cleaning up carcasses that would otherwise take a long time to decompose. What is a cousin? A first cousin is the child of your uncle or aunt. The term cousin can also refer to other family members to whom you are not as closely related. What are plants? Plants and animals make up almost all of the living things in the world. They are alike in a lot of ways. Both are made up of cells. Tiny building blocks of life that produce chemicals that control growth and activity. Often these cells become specialized in a plant or animal, with different types doing particular jobs. In addition, both plants and animals use gases, water, and minerals to carry on life processes. Both experience life cycles in which they are created, grow, reproduce, and die. But plants are very different from animals in one big way. Most don't move around. Because they are rooted to one spot, plants are able to perform a special process called photosynthesis. For this remarkable process, plants use energy from sunlight. A gas in the air called carbon dioxide and water and minerals from soil to produce their own food. Animals can't do this. They must look for food. Eating plants or other animals in order to get the energy they need to live. The waste product produced by photosynthesis is oxygen, the gas that all animals need to breathe. So without plant life, there would be no animal life on Earth. And without plants around to absorb carbon dioxide, 
an excess amount of this gas would linger in our atmosphere. Trapping the sun's heat and causing an unwanted increase in the planet's average temperatures. Plants, then, are essential not only because they provide so much of the food we eat, and provide nourishment for many of the animals we eat, but because they make our air healthier, using up carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen. In addition, we depend on plants to provide us with other things we need. Like wood for building, fibers for making clothes, and medicines to improve our health. If plants make their own food, why do some eat insects? Carnivorous, or meat-eating, plants do make their own food through photosynthesis. But they also capture small prey, most frequently insects, for the minerals that they provide. Usually carnivorous plants, like Venus flytraps, grow in swamps and marshes where the minerals that plants need for growth, especially nitrogen, are in short supply. Minerals from the bodies of insects caught in their leaves allow carnivorous plants to grow in these otherwise unsuitable places. Carnivorous plants usually attract insects with nectar or with a pleasing smell or color. Many have sticky leaves or slippery pouches that trap insects once they land there. The Venus flytrap has pairs of jaw-like leaves that snap shut. When attached trigger hairs are disturbed by a visiting insect. Once insects are trapped, carnivorous plants produce SPE chael chemicals that digest them. Scientists have identified nearly 500 species of carnivorous plants.